Tonight we're looking at Psalms 85 through 87. We'll begin here in Psalm 85. I'll read the psalm and then we'll get into our study. Psalm 85, beginning at verse 1, reading through the entire psalm. The psalmist writes, Lord, you have been favorable to your land. You have brought back the captivity of Jacob. You have forgiven the iniquity of your people. You've covered all their sin, Selah. You have taken away all your wrath. You have turned from the fierceness of your anger. Restore us, O God, of our salvation. Cause your anger toward us to cease. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people and to his saints, but let them not turn back to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth shall spring out of the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yes, the Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and shall make his footsteps our pathway. Now, this is a psalm, a psalm of Korah, and as we've noted just through reading it, it's a psalm that calls for revival in the nation. And uh, as we just read this in this psalm here, God is acknowledged for his goodness. God is acknowledged for his forgiving sins. And he's also being asked to remove his wrath from the people. Notice how he begins here in verses 1 through 3, how he begins by saying, you have been favorable to your land. You have brought back the captivity of Jacob. You've forgiven the iniquity of your people, have covered all their sin. You've taken away all your wrath. You've turned from the fierceness of your anger. So as he begins this psalm, He's speaking concerning the fact that God has restored the nation, so he begins with praise. Now, some scholars believe that he is referring to the return of the uh, Jewish captives from Babylonian captivity. You see, in the Old Testament book of Jeremiah, in Jeremiah chapter 25, verses 11 and 12, the prophet said this. He prophesied, this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. These nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Then it will come to pass when 70 years are completed that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans, for their iniquity, says the Lord, and I will make it a perpetual desolation. Then in Jeremiah 29, 10, he said, Thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you and cause you to return to this place. So there are several Bible scholars who believe that what is being referred to here in, these, in this particular psalm, Psalm 85, is the fact that the Lord has returned the captives from Babylon back to Israel. And for this writer, as he is writing, the restoration of the nation is revealing something very important. Notice verse 2. He's revealing that God has covered their sins. The fact that they have returned, the fact that they have been away and now they have returned, demonstrates that God is restoring them as a nation and has forgiven them of their sins. And so the forgiveness of their sin implies not only the removing of that sin, but also God alleviating them or taking from them the consequences of that sin. And so instead of judgment and instead of wrath, they now look forward to his restoration and they're looking forward to his blessings. That's what happens when God forgives you of your sins. Instead of you looking forward to a, a certain indignation, instead of you looking towards a, a judgment, when you get saved... When you open your heart to the Lord, when you ask Jesus Christ to enter into your life, when you say, God, be, be merciful unto me because I'm a miserable sinner, and Lord, there's not a single thing I can do to make myself of any consequence to you. There's nothing that I can do to remedy my own situation. There's nothing I can do, no good work or no effort on my part that is going to cause you to somehow feel that you are obligated to forgive me of my sins because there's just nothing I can do that is that great. When you come to understand that, when you come to realize that there's nothing that you can do, can do in your own strength, or your own ability, your own goodness, when you realize that your own righteousness is like filthy rags, and when you come to understand that there's none good, no, not one, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and you fall on your face before God and you say, God, be, be merciful unto me because I'm a sinner, like that, that sinner who was beating on his chest and that's all he could say. Next to him is a man who is self-righteous and is thanking God for all that he is and 
all the things that he does that are so good. And yet right next to him is a man who just won't even lift his eyes to heaven, Jesus said. He just smote his breast and said, Lord, be merciful unto me. When you have that kind of mentality, when you kind of realize that there's just nothing that I can do that will ever in any way satisfy God's righteous indignation towards me, and, and you ask God for mercy, and you say, God, forgive me. I, I've blown it. I'm sorry. I, I don't know what to do. Well, at that point, not only does God forgive you, but God restores you and, and, and removes the consequences of that sin because, see, the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. It's appointed unto men to die once, and after this, the judgment. When you stand before the Lord, either you stand in the righteousness of Jesus Christ as a, a sinner who's been washed by his blood and forgiven by God, or you stand in your own righteousness. It's that easy. You stand before him clothed in your own good works. And the Bible makes it very clear that our good works are not sufficient. But when you stand clothed in the righteousness of Christ, when you stand before God as a sinner who's been washed by the blood of Jesus, well, God not only forgives you, but God also has removed the consequence of your sin, and you receive his blessings. In Isaiah, in Isaiah 54, verses 7 and 8, the Lord God says to the nation, For a mere moment I have forsaken you, but with great mercies I will gather you. With a little wrath I hid my face from you for a moment. But with everlasting kindness, I will have mercy on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. So for the writer, the restoration of the nation reveals that God has covered their sin. In verse 4, when he says, Restore, O God, of our salvation, cause your anger toward us to cease. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again? that your people may rejoice in you. Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. While well, he speaks concerning the Lord restoring, that word restore us, when he says restore us, O God, the word restore means to refresh and to repair. And that's what he's asking for, refreshing from the Lord and God's reparation or repairing of them. The Bible in, in Psalm 51, verses 7 and 8 says, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. So, Lord, refresh me. Lord, repair me. Lord, you're the one who through your conviction and through your hand upon me has, you have broken me. But now I'm asking you to repair me. He says, cause your anger toward us to cease. The only way that that takes place is through the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to remember that. The only way that God's anger towards us ceases is when we have a relationship with Christ. If you take notes, John chapter 3, verse 36 says this, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So the bottom line is, is before you got saved, God's settled displeasure was upon you. That's what he means in John 3, 36, the wrath of God abides on you. So he's saying, cause your anger toward us to cease. The fact of the matter is, is without Christ, it, it settles on us. The wrath settles on us. But in 1 John, in chapter 2, verse 2, John said that Jesus is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Now, the word propitiation isn't a word that we generally use in common conversation. Today, did you use the word? Were you speaking to somebody and say, oh, by the way, propitiation? No, most of us didn't use that word. That's a theological word. It's a, it's a big word that simply means that the word propitiation simply means that God's anger has been satisfied. Jesus Christ is the propitiation, meaning Jesus Christ satisfies the righteous indignation of God. The Bible says that God hates sin and God is angry with sinners every day. We saw that in Psalm 7, verse 11. So God has to deal with sin. Now, until I get right with him as a righteous God, he has a settled anger towards me. But Jesus Christ took upon himself my sin. When he did that, he settled my account before God. When he became the full satisfaction, when God looks upon him now, my sin is dealt with, and God's anger has been satisfied. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, John said it this way. He said, in this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us 
and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. We didn't even begin by loving him. He began the process by first loving us. Every father, every mama in this room understands what that means when the Bible says he loved us first. Because when you found out that you were pregnant, hopefully you were happy about that. But when you found out that you were pregnant, there's a bonding, later a bondage, but there's a bonding that takes place between you and the child. There's this, this sense in you that something wonderful is happening that you are carrying a child. And, and I can remember with, uh, with our children and all how that was with Marie. I can remember as a father, Marie, as she was pregnant, Marie didn't begin to show for several months, and so I knew she was pregnant and all because she was going through, well, one, is because we had gone to the doctor and the doctor had notified us that she was, but also because she was going through all the symptoms of pregnancy. I can still remember we were driving home one time from Pomona going home to Roland Heights when we lived there, and, and as we were driving, Marie turns to me and says to me, pull over. Now, we're on the 60 freeway, and she says, pull over, and I said, you got to be kidding. We're on the freeway. I'm not about to pull over here on the freeway. It's too dangerous to do that. She says, I'm sick. I'm very sick. You have to pull over. And I smiled at her, and I said, Honey, we're only 10 minutes away from where we live. You know, just, you know, no, I'm not going to pull over. And I'll never forget what she said. She said, Listen, if you don't pull over, I will vomit all over you. I pulled over. <laughs> I did pull over. And she hung her head out, and I went, Oh, my. You know, she was definitely pregnant, you know, and, and as she began to grow and started to swell up with that child and everything, you know, and she really did swell. She was swell. You know, little wrists got all swollen and her ankles became swollen and she fought the waddle. I mean, she didn't want to waddle, all of that. I began to, um, as, you know, as the, um, the father of the child and all, I, I began to feel incredible feelings. I can still remember putting my hand on her stomach and the baby Corinne would kick and I can still remember just, you know, just what a thrill that was and, and all that process and then when Marie, uh, her water broke and we went to the hospital and, and, and Corinne was early and as we went to the hospital we really weren't expecting her uh, that soon and, and uh, um, you know, and, and she's there, and, and we had gone through the Lamaze thing. You know, you guys remember that? Or they still do that, Lamaze? What a ripoff. But we went through the Lamaze thing. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the hee-hee, ha-ha-hoo-hoo -hoo kind of thing. You know, and Marie was laying on her side, and she began to have back pain, back labor. And I had to put my fist in her lower back, and I had to press her, and, you know, and I could feel the baby because the baby's face was, or whatever was there on, the, on my fist. And then I was pushing her, and Marie's, you know, doing all of this. And, and then there's that point where you're supposed to breathe certain ways. And, and I remember drawing up real close to her and putting my face next to her and starting to whisper, honey, okay, it's time to ha-ha, you know, ha-ha, hee-hee-hoo-hoo, you know, all of that. It's time to ha-ha. And she, she grits her teeth at me, you know. And she says, get, you know, stop breathing in my face. Get out of my face. Sit back and shut up, basically. And I'm thinking, what a ripoff. I paid $25 for you to yell at me. I could have done that for free, man. And I sat back. 33 hours later, she gave birth. Yeah. That's what she gets. Uh, 33 hours later. <laughs> Eve shouldn't have sinned. It's not my fault. <laughs> 33 hours later, she gives birth. And they bring that ugly little thing to me. <laughs> ugly little thing. Oh, my. Oh, my. And you look at it saying, will they outgrow this? Is this something that, well, if you twist her this way, she's kind of cute, you know? If you wrap her up, the blanket over her face, she's, she's all right. But you know what? It's true, isn't it? I mean, I tease about that. Of course I'm teasing. She was the most beautiful baby in the hospital. Of course she was, you know. Every father says that. Every mama says that. Because to us, they are. Even though you're all wrong and I was right. But anyway, <laughs> beautiful baby. And uh, you just are absolutely head over heels in love with that baby.
absolutely. And you never stop loving them. But the day comes when they say, you've never really loved me. You, you don't love me. And you look at them and you, and you laugh, man. You say, you've got to be kidding. You know, right now I don't like you, but I still love you, you know. <laughs> But you, you always love them. And the funny thing about it, and this is something the Lord gave to me so many, so many years ago, is I loved her long before she loved me. Mama loved her long before she loved Mama. And the Lord said to me, and I loved you before you loved me. My love is from everlasting towards you. I love you that way. You know, and the Lord does love us that way. And this is love, he says. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. And he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. And not for our sins alone, but for the sins of the whole world, he had said earlier. And so he's saying to the Lord, cause your anger towards us to cease. But we know the only way that the anger of the Lord can cease towards us is through Jesus Christ. Show us, in verse 7, your mercy, O Lord. Grant us your salvation. You see, when he says in verse 6, will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you, he's simply saying, bring us back to life. Stir up within us the joy of salvation. And that, to me, is a tremendous, tremendous blessing that we have in the Lord. When he says, revive us that your, may, your people may rejoice the surprise that you have when you come to Christ, one of the surprises, the wonderful surprises that you have in him is the joy that he grants to you. Jesus Christ gives you joy. That is something you can't go to the store to purchase. He gives you peace. That's something you can't find any way else. He gives you hope and he gives you love. He gives you all of those things because he saves you. And so when he's speaking here and he says, revive us again in verse 6, that your people may rejoice in you, joy is one of the elements that determines or demonstrates, rather, that we actually have been saved. In Psalm 118, verse 15, the, the Bible says, the voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tents of the righteous. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 2, verses 46 and 47, this is a mark of the early church, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. There's the joy of salvation that the Lord gives to us. There's that deep, deep well of reality that though my day may, may not have gone very well, perhaps I went through a tough day today, or perhaps I went through a tough week or a month or even a tough year or a life, when I gave my heart to Christ, he takes that, that sorrow and replaces it with his joy. And I can rejoice in the Lord. I find it interesting to note, and you can do this, and I encourage you to do so. When you read the book of Philippians, one of the key words in Philippians is joy or rejoicing. Even though the apostle is in prison when he writes that, the central issue he wants to deal with with the Philippian church is the knowledge that in Christ they can have joy. That's something you can't get in the world. That's something that you can't purchase. That's something that you don't have when you drive that new thing, whatever it may be, or wear that new thing that you bought. You can enjoy it, but you don't have joy from it. You have joy from your relationship with the Lord. That's where you have your joy. And that's the one thing that I really long for by the way, for my own life, is I want to walk in the joy of the Spirit of God. Joy is one of the fruit uh, evidences of the love of God. It's a fruit of the Spirit, and that's what I want in my life is the joy that God gives to me, not the happiness. The word happiness r relates to circumstances, happenings, those things that are occurring day by day in my life that, that can push me into an area where I might feel satisfied, at least for that day. What I'm looking for is something deeper than that. I'm looking for joy. I'm looking for that joy and that peace that passes understanding where I can go through whatever it is that I go through, and it may be a struggle or a hard time or a very difficult situation, but I don't lose the joy of the Lord because the joy of the Lord is my strength. And so he says, revive us again that your people may rejoice in you. Going on in verse 8, he says, I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people and to his saints, but, but let them not turn back to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. So he's saying, I'm submitted. 
I am submitted to whatever God has to say to me. Notice how he says that in verse 8. He says, I will hear what God the Lord will speak. That's a very important thing to not let pass you by. He's not simply saying that my ears are, are capable of, you know, determining sounds. I can hear things. That word here, when he speaks of it, I will hear what God the Lord will speak, speaks more of a determination of the will to not only hear but to obey what he is saying. When the Lord is speaking, he's not just hearing the words, he's doing what God says, and there's a difference. There are people who can hear, but they will not do. My dad could lecture me all day long about, you know, whatever it is on his mind for that day. Son, don't drink. Son, you shouldn't smoke. Son, you ought to get a job. Son, you ought to, you know, my dad could lecture me all day long, and, and the words, would, would, I could hear them, but I was not listening to them with a the heart to obey. I could hear them, but they didn't impact my life. When he speaks in verse 8 and says, I will hear what God the Lord will speak, he will speak peace to his people and his saints, He's saying, I have made a determination to do whatever God has told me to do. I am submitted to him. And in, in the submission to him, I have salvation. Verse 9, surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. In listening to what he has to say, I can be saved. If I reject what he has to say, there's no chance for me. Verse 10, mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth shall spring out of the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yes, the Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Mercy, truth, and righteousness, he says, work together to produce peace. It's through God's love, God's truth, that his blessings are poured out on his people. James told us this. Every good gift and every perfect gift cometh down from above from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow nor turning. The Lord is the one who pours out his blessings on us, and that's what he's speaking about. When he says to us in verse 13, righteousness will go before him and shall make his footsteps our pathway, those who follow God are walking in his footsteps. That's an interesting way to put it. Righteousness will go before him and shall make his footsteps our pathway. It's like when you walk into an area where they put pavers, and there may be around you, you know, foliage, grass, whatever it may be, but as you're walking, you're stepping on the pavers, and you're following that path to the door. The point he's making is righteousness is the pathway God has established for you. So you step, if you will, in his footsteps, following him every step of the way. Like that illustration I've used 150 times with you, my Joseph following after me when I walked out of the back door of my house and, and we had taken all the lawn out and it was nothing but dirt and uh, there had been a light rain and I went outside and as I was walking outside, crossing from the, from the uh, back door to the, to the back fence, and then I hear the screen door slam, and my Joseph, who's just a few years old, two, three years old, I can hear him grunting as he's striding, and I turn and I see these exaggerated steps, and, and, and I ask him, what are you doing, Joseph? And, and he yells at me. He says, I'm walking in your footsteps, Daddy. And he was stretching his foot to, to match my stride and little exaggerated steps in this little boy. And I've shared with you before that the Lord said, be careful where you go, because wherever you go, your son will follow. Well, in the same way, he's saying God strides ahead of us, and we need to match his stride in the direction that he's going. That's how you walk in righteousness, by pursuing him. He shall make his footsteps our pathway. Now, Psalm 86 is a psalm of David. And David, the psalmist, writes, Bow down your ear, O Lord, hear me, for I am poor and needy, Preserve my life, for I am holy. You are my God. Save your servant who trusts in you. Be merciful to me, O Lord, for I cry to you all day long. Rejoice the soul of your servant. For to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and abundant in mercy to all those who call upon you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer, and attend to the voice of my supplications. 
In the day of my trouble, I will call upon you, for you will answer me. Among the gods, there's none like you, O Lord, nor are there any works like your, like your works. All nations whom you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord. I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I will praise you, O Lord, my God, with all my heart, and I will glorify your name forevermore. For great is your mercy toward me, and you have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. O God, the proud have risen against me, and a mob of violent men have sought my life and have not set you before them. But you, O Lord, are a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in mercy and truth. O turn to me and have mercy on me. Give your strength to your servant and save the son of your maidservant. Show me a sign for good that those who hate me may see it and be ashamed because you, O Lord, you, Lord, have helped me and comforted me. This is a psalm of David. And David is saying that God is good, God is forgiving, and God does great things. And as you look at the psalm, notice with me how he has said that he wants God to reveal his great strength and to deliver him from the proud. That's what he said in verse 14 when he said, Oh God, the proud have risen against me. A mob of violent men have sought my life and have not set you before them. He's asking God to deliver him. And that's what he's doing in this particular psalm. He's praying to the Lord for his deliverance, and he's thanking God because God is great. So in the first few verses, notice how he says, Bow down your ear, O Lord, hear me, for I am poor and needy. I need you, he's saying. I need you, so I'm asking you to hear me. I need you, so I'm asking you to preserve me. I need you, so I'm asking you to save me. And because I need you, Lord, I'm asking you to be merciful to me and to restore joy in my life. I've been crying to you, he says in verse 3. I cry to you all day long. And therefore, verse 4, rejoice the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. I'm desperate for you. I'm incapable of saving myself. God, I need your help. And I'm asking you to help me, not on the basis of my own goodness, not because I am better than other people, not because my life has been miserable and I deserve a break I'm asking you to help me on the basis of your goodness. I'm asking you to help me on the basis of your loving kindness. I'm asking you to help me because I need your mercy. God, I need your help. In Jeremiah 17, verse 14, we read, Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, I shall be saved, for you are my praise. I need your help. And so the psalmist David is simply saying, God, I need your help. I, I'm poor and I'm needy. I am unable to do this for myself. You know, it's a very difficult place to get to when you finally admit that you can't save yourself. Human pride being what it is, some of us have a little bit more than others, can really be a major stumbling block in ever really understanding the ways of the Lord. As a matter of fact, it will keep you from ever understanding the ways of the Lord. I can remember when I was a young man, I was going to Biola. Marie and I were married. I don't remember at the moment whether we had had Corinne yet or not, but it was early in our marriage. And I had been going to Biola University. It was actually called Biola College at that time. And um, I didn't have money to pay for my tuition. And I'm one of these guys who was raised by a man who, my father, who, who said, basically, you pay your bills before you put food on the table. Whatever you have left over after paying your bills, that's what you eat with. My dad taught me that. Make sure that your, your, your credit is clean and, and, and good. My dad taught me that my name, my reputation, was basically all that I really had. And therefore, integrity was of utmost importance. So never say you're going to do something and not do it. Never sign your name on a contract and not honor it. Never, ever lie because that's your name. And my dad told me that when I was a little boy, and he'd say it in various ways, but that's the way it was as I grew up. Now I'm going to Biola. I'm in my early 20s. I don't have the money to pay tuition. I can't remember the exact amount. I think it was $1,500. 
and I didn't have the money to conclude my tuition. I did not have the money to pay it. And I can still remember going in with Marie and, and sitting across from the financial fellow there, and, and I said to him, I've come in to let you know that I don't have the money to pay my tuition, but I want to make good on it, and I want to work with you to figure out how I'm going to be able to pay it off. And I remember him looking at me and starting to ask me questions. He'd say, can you afford to pay $100 a month? And I turned and I looked at Marie. She was the one who kept the book. And she said, she nodded her, her, you know, no. And I turned to him, I said, nope. He said, can you pay us $75 a month? And I looked at Marie and I said, can we afford $75 a month? And she shakes her head, no. And I looked at him and I said, no. He says, can you afford $50 a month? And I looked at Marie, I said, can we afford $50 a month? And Marie's looking at me, she thinks for a minute, and she nods her head, yeah, we can do that. So I looked at the guy, and I said, I think we can make $50 a month. Now, when I think about it now, that's $12.50 a week that I was haggling with Marie over whether I had that. That today represents, what, three cups of coffee a week or more. Starbucks is going broke. They had to raise prices, but anyway. <laughs> and I nodded my head. And I said, I think we can do that. And I got in the car with Marie, and I said, can we really do that? She said, we're going to have to trust the Lord. Because what he did is he wiped off from my bill like two-thirds of it. He said, we'll just pay off like $1,000, and you will pay us this uh, $500 over the course of this many months at the rate of 500 bucks, you know, or 50 bucks for 10 months. And I went home and I was saying, I don't know if I can afford that. I really don't know if I can afford that. I was teaching a home Bible study. And I went to the home Bible study that night and uh, gave the study. And I was asked by one of the members of the study, is there anything we can pray for you about? And I remember looking at them saying, well, not really. You know, the Lord's doing wonderful things in my life. They said, are you sure? Is there anything that we can pray for? And I said... You know, I didn't, I said, you know, I didn't really know what to say. So I said, well, I've got to pay a bill at Biola. I, I'd like the strength to be able to do that. And they said, we'll pray for you. The next day, I get a phone call at home. Somebody at the Bible study had called Biola and said, what does David Rosales owe you? And they said, X amount of money. And they sent him a check and paid my bill off. And the Lord has always tried to train me that he, if you are humble and admit that he's there for you. And he uses the members of the body of Christ very often to do that wonderful thing on his behalf, you see. And we need to understand that when you get to the point, point where you can honestly say to God, I am weak, I am poor, Lord, I am needy. Without you, I can do nothing. That is a difficult place for us to get to because of our pride. But when we finally say, God, bow down your ear and hear me, I am poor and needy, and we cry out, preserve my life. When he says, I'm holy, that simply means I am devoted to you. Why? Because you are my God. And he goes on to say, save your servant who trusts in you. Be merciful to me. I cry to you all day long. Rejoice the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. You, Lord, are good and ready to forgive, abundant in mercy to those who call upon you. When you cry out like that, the Lord hears you. The psalmist in Psalm 109, 26 says, Help me, O Lord my God, save me according to your mercy. In verse 6, Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Attend to the voice of my supplications. In the day of my trouble, I will call upon you, for you will answer me. God, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you listen to me when I cry because your ear is open to my cry. In Psalm 91, verse 15, he shall call upon me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. He goes on and he says in verse 8, Among the gods there's none like you, O Lord, nor are there any works like your works. All nations whom you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. You are the great, and you are the awesome God. And one day, all nations shall worship you. 
In Psalm 22, uh, verse 27 and 28, all the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nation shall worship before you, for the kingdom is the Lord's. He rules over the nations. Revelation 15, 4 asks the question, who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? You alone are holy. All nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested. You alone, he says, are God. All shall come and worship before you and glorify your name. The Bible tells us every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Verse 11, teach me your way, O Lord. I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I will praise you, O Lord my God, with all my heart, and I will glorify your name forevermore. For great is your mercy toward me, and you have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. Now, I want you to see this. Notice in verse 11 how he says, unite my heart. Notice in verse 12, I will praise you, O Lord, my God, with all my heart. Unite my heart so that it's not divided, so that it is united in its worship and praise to you. I don't want to have a divided heart. I want to have a heart that is completely set on worshiping you. I want to walk in your way. And so I'm asking you to keep my heart united in its affection for you. The Bible tells us that we're to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, not just a portion of it. God doesn't ask me to commit myself in just a small part. He says, I want you to worship me with all of your strength, all of your heart, with all that is within you. Well, when Marie and I got married, you know, and I made my vows to her, and this is just marriage, I mean, compared to walking with God. And I made my vows to that woman. I promised her before God and witnesses and the pastor that I would love her with all of my heart. I didn't say to her, you know, baby, I'm going to love you with at least a quarter of this heart, you know, and that's plenty because i got a big heart. No. I said, honey... I said, I am, I am committed to you and to only you for the rest of my life. There will be no other. There will never be ever anybody that will take you and the love I have for you that will ever take your place. I will love you until the day comes when when you place me in the arms of Jesus Christ, when that day comes, I will love you until the moment I die. That's commitment. You know, my dad used to call my mom. My, my dad didn't call her Bonnie. <laughs> if my dad said Bonnie, he was mad at her. He never used her name. Any more than I ever really used my, my Marie's name. I used her name to you. But when I talked to Marie, you know, I don't think this is something I can't share with you. I, don't, I think most of you understand. We have nicknames for one another. Um, but her, she's mama. I mean, when I talk to her, she's mama. That's who, that's who she is. And I, if you ever see me talking to her, you'll hear me say that. I'll say, mama. You know, it's not I'm her little boy, you know. It's that that's the way it is, you know. <laughs> now, you might have a nickname for your, your, your mate, you know, whatever. You know, that's my nickname for my wife. I call her mama. I've called her mama since forever, as long as I can know. And all of that. Well, you know what my dad called my mom, Mama. That's what my dad called her. He, I, I very seldom have ever heard her, him mention her name. He would just say Mama, and he'd talk to me, your Mama, or he'd talk to her and say, Mama, do you know the last word that my father said to her was Mama? That was the last word he said to her. And he was all hooked up, and he was going home to be with the Lord, and he was in the hospital, and, and my mom was standing there next to him, and, and he was in so much pain. And, and he looks up at her, and, and, and his last words that she ever heard come out of his mouth for her was mama, his commitment to her. That was his way of saying, I love you for all of my life, forever. And that's the way he said it. That's what I said to my wife when I said to Marie, I will love you with all of my heart. Not a portion of it, 
Not, not three out of seven days. Not one out of seven days. Not an hour out of all the hours in the week. I will love you every day, 24 hours a day. I will sleep and have dreams of you, which is true. I will awake and you'll be next to me until the Lord takes me home. That was marriage. That's marriage. That's how it is. That's our marriage. And that's how your marriages are too. It's one time, all time, forever, and I love you. And it grows every day. Well, if that's how I am and you are in our marriages, how much more so with our Lord? How much more so with Jesus? How much more so the commitment that you have to God? And you want to know the problem with a lot of people today? They don't have that commitment. They want to give God an hour a week. They want to give God maybe two, three hours a week. But the rest is theirs. The rest is theirs. God says, no, that's not how it works. Your whole life is committed to me. And by the way, as your whole life is committed to me, I can bless you like nothing else in this world ever will. How unwise for me to think that I can receive joy and pleasure from the things that are passing away. But when I place my hand in the heart of my heart in the hand of the Lord, well, it's different. In Joel, in chapter 2, verse 12, it says, Therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning. And Samuel, in 1 Samuel 12, 24, said, Fear the Lord, serve him in truth with all your heart, for consider what great things he has done for you. In verse 14, O God, the proud have risen against me, a mob of violent men have sought my life and have not set you before them. But you, O Lord, are a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in mercy and truth. As a man who is sold out to you, I'm not very popular with the ungodly, and yet I will trust in your love for me, and that's enough for me. That's what he's saying in verse 14 when he says, the proud have risen against me. I'm sold out to you, and those who are not have a difficult time with me. They're a mob of violent men. They actually seek my life. But he says, I'm going to trust in you. That's what he means when he says, you, O Lord, are a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in mercy and truth. I will trust in you. In verse 16, O turn to me and have mercy on me. Give your strength to your servant and save the son of your maidservant. Show me a sign for good that those who hate me may see it and be ashamed because you, Lord, have helped me and comforted me. This particular scripture, verse 17, is a scripture that I have printed out, and I have it on my computer screen. Verse 17, show me a sign for good that those who hate me and see it may be ashamed because you, Lord, have helped me and comforted me. You see, um, sometimes people may desire evil to come upon you, that it may prove their assessment of you is correct. Without going into an awful lot, I can tell you this. Sometimes you, especially those perhaps who have been with us for a short time or maybe visitors tonight, you come to a church like this and you see a big building and you see a lot of activity and you may think that it's always been that way and it hasn't. My Bible studies began with a handful of people and went that way for many years, for many years. For the first several years, I never saw more than 20, 30 people at all in a Bible study. Wednesday, my, Wednesday night Bible studies in this church here used to be in a house, and we remained in a house for over a year, probably closer to two. We never needed to have a, anything bigger than a, a house that could hold 30, 40, maybe 50 people. And that's the way it was. And so you can come and you can look and you can say, well, they got a big old building. There's a lot of activities. The church is full on Sundays. Um, a lot of things going on around here and think that it was always that way, and it hasn't been. Sometimes people will come and look and they'll say, well, you know, it must be nice. It must be nice to pastor and, you know, to have all the things that, that, that uh, you probably have and all, and it looks like an easy job and all. But one of the things you may not realize in ministry is when you... Uh, when you're being used by the Lord, and our church is being used by the Lord, um, not everybody likes that. Not everybody admires that. Not everybody thinks that's a good thing. 
And sometimes because of the nature of our ministry and because of the nature of my ministry in particular, there are those who, who, who don't necessarily like me. Some people don't like me at all, and some people um, say some of the worst things that you can imagine and have done so for many years, and that's just the way it is, and that's the cost, and I'm not thin-skinned about it. That's just the truth. You know, there are quite a number of people who have said some of the most evil things that you can imagine over the years. We've had some of the oddest things take place. And they'll see something happen in your life. They'll hear something, a tragedy, a pain. And uh, sometimes they rejoice in that. Sometimes they're glad when you hurt. Sometimes they're glad when, when I hurt. And it comes back to me. And the things that are said sometimes are very cruel. And you wonder, why would somebody feel that? And so I took this psalm a long time ago, and, I, and I, I typed it out, show me a sign for good that those who hate me may see it and be ashamed because you, Lord, have helped me and comforted me. Because, Lord, you're on my side. And even though they'll say things, and sometimes they'll say the cruelest things, Lord, just keep your hand on me so that even when they say unkind things, um, they may be ashamed because it's not true what they're saying. And may they repent, but keep your hand on me for good, Lord. You see, God's blessings on his life revealed that he was right with the Lord, and they couldn't speak against that. And finally, Psalm 87, a song of Korah, the sons of Korah. His foundation is in the holy mountains, the Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. Glorious things are spoken of you, O city of God, Selah. I will make mention of Rahab and Babylon to those who know me. Behold, O Philistia and Tyre with Ethiopia, this one was born there. And of Zion it will be said, this one and that one were born in her. And the Most High himself shall establish her. The Lord will record when he registers the peoples this one was born there, Selah. Both the singers and the players on instruments say, all my springs are in you. Now, this is an interesting psalm. It's a psalm of, of, of praise to the beauty of the city of God, which is referred to here as, as Zion, Mount Zion, or the city of Jerusalem where the temple is built now or will be rebuilt. And so this is a, a song of praise to the beauty of it. Now, when he speaks here about uh, verse 1, his foundation is the holy mountains. The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. Glorious things are spoken of you, O city of God. When he speaks of the city of God there, uh, that, that represents the presence of the Lord. It's because that's where the, uh, the government of God uh, is going to be ultimately established. And so he's speaking of the glorious things that are there, and that would be what he'd call the foundation of the holy mountains. Now, it's interesting in verse 4 how he says, I will make mention of Rahab and Babylon to those who know me. Behold, O Philistia and Tyre with Ethiopia, this one was born there. Now, Rahab is an ancient name for Egypt. And so what you have is you have Rahab and Babylon. If you were looking at a map, what that represents on a map, Egypt being south and Babylon being to the north, that represents the uh, southern and northern powers of the world during the, the time of this writing. When he speaks of Philistia, Tyre, and Ethiopia, that represents all the lands in between. So that's what he's speaking about here when he says, I will make mention of Rahab and Babylon, Philistia, Tyre, and Ethiopia. From the south to the north and everything in between, I'm going to be making mention of this. Now, when he speaks concerning that, and he's speaking concerning a praise that goes to God, the glorious things that are spoken of him and of his dwelling place. It's interesting how you have Ethiopia here in verse, in verse 4. And I'll show you a couple of things here very briefly. Uh, Ethiopia. That reminds us of uh, Acts chapter 8, when the evangelist Philip had been in Samaria. And as he was there, a mighty revival had taken place. And Peter and John, two apostles, had come and, and had ministered there, and the Holy Spirit had fallen in a powerful way amongst the Sam Samaritan people. Now, what happens is God speaks to him and says to Philip, now I want you to go to Gaza. Now, Gaza is desert. 
as it goes down south into the Gaza region, there's an Ethiopian eunuch. And the Ethiopian is reading in the book of Isaiah. And he begins to read the 53rd, what we consider to be the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. As he reads it, he turns to Philip, and Philip says to him, do you understand what you're reading? And the man says, how can I understand unless somebody helps me? Is he speaking concerning himself or some other man? And Philip, from that part, begins to preach to him Jesus Christ, and the Ethiopian eunuch gets saved. He took that message with him back to Ethiopia and presented that undoubtedly to the people there. And so he speaks concerning Ethiopia. He also speaks concerning Tyre. Tyre is uh, in modern Lebanon. There are, there actually used to call them sister cities or twin cities. There is Tyre and Sidon. And, and when you're looking at the map of Israel and you're going up the West Coast and imagine it's like the state of California and you go up into the Oregon area, that's where Tyre and Sidon would be just past the California-Oregon border. Well, the Israel and Lebanese border, uh, that's where it would be there. And there Jesus was ministering. And as Jesus was there in the coast or in the, uh, in the borders of, of that region there, there was a woman there uh, we call the Syrophoenician woman who approached him. You remember the story. She had a daughter whom she referred to as being severely demon-possessed and had asked the Lord Jesus Christ if he would cast the demon out of her daughter. And you remember how Jesus spoke to her and said, it is not meat, it's not right to take the children's bread and to cast it to the little dogs? Because he said, I have come but for the, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I haven't come for you. You are a Syrophoenician woman, so it's not right to take what belongs to the nation of Israel and to give it to, to the dogs. Now, now, I shared this with you, those of you who were with us on, in our study of Mark in chapter 7, and I shared with you that, that normally the, the Jews had two words that they would use for a dog. One, one word would be for the ravenous dogs that would uh, scavenge from the, from the trash and would attack people, and they would, they would run in packs, and, and there was a dog for them, but there was another uh, name for them as a dog, but there was another word for dog that would be used concerning the puppies that were the house dogs that you would have there that lived with you, that were your pets. They were domesticated, and, and, and they, were, they, they were the kind of dog that you loved. And all. Jesus used that word when he spoke to this woman. It's not right uh, to, to do that. She said, well, the little dogs, you know, eat from the master's tables. I'm not asking you for a full course. I'm asking for scraps. That's all I need. She was a Phoenician, a Syrophoenician woman. And so when you look at that, you have a picture of the fact that the gospel indeed goes forth, and it's going to go throughout, and God's praise is going to take place. And that's what he's speaking about here. God's word is going to go forth, and people all over are going to come to him. In verse 5 of Zion, it will be said, this one and that one was born in her, and the Most High himself shall establish her. The Lord will record when he registers the peoples. This one was born there. Both the singers and the players on instruments say, all my springs are in you. So Zion is going to be a mother city of all the faithful followers of God, and God himself is going to do the registration of his inhabitants in his city. As a matter of fact, our names are registered as people who belong there, and that's what he's speaking about when he says this one was born there. Now, verse 7, both the singers and the players on instruments say, all my springs are in you. So this is a closing picture of the joy that we believers have in him, the joy that comes to the springs of living water that God has provided one last thing, and it's an important thing, and it's what I'm praying for us as a church. I'm praying for this. I've been praying for this for some time now. For us as a church, that we might be open to the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. Listen, and I'll say this briefly. The Jesus movement, when I got saved in what was called the Jesus movement back in 1970, we were a bunch of young kids totally open to whatever God wants to do. God understands something. And if you understand this, you'll understand how come I speak and teach the way I do. You'll understand it if you can understand this. We were open to what God wanted to do. I came out 
of a religious system. I came out of a denominational system. And so I thought I was a Christian. But when the gospel was clearly presented and the Holy Spirit actually convicted me of my sin, and I finally realized I'm not a Christian. And I opened my heart and said, God, be merciful to me. I need you. Forgive me. I came out of the world, burned out from the world, and I was only 20, but I had been living pretty rough for a while. And I came out, and I said, I don't want that anymore. I'm tired of the heartache. I'm tired of, of, of the things that I'm doing, the stealing and the lying and, and the drugs and, and the alcohol and the hatred and the anger and bitterness. I'm tired of all of that. I'm tired of making my mom and dad cry. I'm tired of, of messing you know, the girls up that I'm with and hurting them the way that I do and using them the way I... I'm tired of all of this. I don't want any more of this. I want to be different. I want a different life. I'm sick of this. I can't take it anymore. That's how I got saved. I said, I, I, it's all or nothing, God. I, I don't want... What I have in him, I want something real, something substantial, something powerful. I need you. Now, that's how I got saved, and my friends were all that way. And so when we were introduced to the idea that the Holy Spirit is not the silent partner of the Trinity, but he has gifts and operations that he can, he can perform in my life, that he could fill me with his power and transform me from the inside. That was revolutionary because the effort was no longer placing on me, being placed on me where I had to stop lying, just do the best that I can to tell the truth. Now I was able to speak the truth in love because I had been forgiven of my sins. I had a brand new life. I had the power to do that. And you know, when we used to gather together, like Bible studies like this, we would gather together after the Bible study, and we would continue to pray, and we'd continue to worship, and, and we'd go over the things that we spoke about. And my friends and I would be in the house, and, and we'd say, do you hear what, what Lonnie said when Lonnie said this, this, and that? What do you think about that? How does that work in our life? And then we'd pray, God, in Jesus' name, I want to walk in your footsteps. That's how I prayed. That's how I learned to pray. I want to walk in your footsteps. I want to do what I read tonight. God, in Jesus' name, make it so. And I was at a Bible study, and I saw a young man who was speaking to himself in a language that I, I couldn't understand. And it was at the house, and I turned to my friend, and I said, what's he doing? He said, he was baptized in the Holy Spirit tonight. He's speaking in tongues. And I said, what is tongues? He said, well, it's a heavenly language, you know. I said, really? I'm a brand new Christian. I've been a Christian for a week or two. I have no clue what that really means. But somebody sits next to me, and they say, what's he doing? And I turned and I looked at him with this knowing look, and I said, speaking in tongues, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit tonight. <laughs> he said, really? What language is he speaking? And I think it's Hebrew, you know. <laughs> I don't know. All I know is that we were open, and I began to pray, and I said, Father, and that night we prayed, and we, we were sitting in a circle, and I said, listen, he was just, they told me he's baptized with the Holy Spirit. What does that mean, and how can I have that? What does that mean, and how can I have that? Why? Why? because I need all the help I can get, because I need all the power I can get. That's why. He said, oh, the Bible says, will not God give the Holy Spirit to those who but ask? Why don't you pray and ask? I can still remember holding hands and praying in Jesus' name, Lord, fill me, fill me with your Holy Spirit. You know, Jesus in John chapter 7 said this. The background is found in verses 37 through 39, on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. This he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. 
for the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. You see, the Spirit and the bride say, Come, let him who hears say, Come, and let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. I want us as a church to drink deeply in the Spirit of God. That's what's going to change your life. When, when, when I stop just marking my Bible and my Bible starts marking my heart, then I change. When the Holy Spirit takes residence in me. You know, a lot of people are saying, gosh, I'm afraid to be doing something loony or wacky. You know, well, the Lord is, you know, all you need to do is look at the life of Jesus, and he wasn't either of those things. He was in complete control, but he, was in, he had power. What I'm asking for from the Lord is the power of his spirit manifested through my life by his gifts, his operations. I want that. I want a drink of that water. You see, the singers and the players on instruments say, all my springs are in you. Everything that pours out of me has first come from my drinking deeply of you. I want your spirit in my life that I might live in a way that brings you glory.